in law. So they use legalese to confuse you, and they do a great job. They've been doing it for, well, since there's been automobiles on the road practically, the licenses started with just being identification, and there was no charge for it. And then the next time, they had expiration dates on them. And then the time after that, they charged for them. So the camel's nose gets into the tent, and they keep going and going and rolling. And here's what you end up with today, enhanced driver's license, which today are optional. But I can't tell you that they're not going to be optional tomorrow. They'll probably be mandatory. Just enough people are fighting, they don't want chips. And that's what they are. Uh, let's see. I want to give you a couple definitions here. I don't know, Jeff, I didn't forget about you. I just want to go back to some of these definitions. Um, one funny thing I came across in here, which kind of opened up the book to let you know that this book is written entirely for people that are going to be in commerce. All of this comes down from uh, USC Title 49, that's United States Code, and CFR. Code of Federal Regulations, Title 49, same thing. And that all has to do with commerce because that's all Congress has authority to control. They have no control over you as an individual person or we the people. And uh, one thing I found in here was registering a motorcycle. And it's the only place I really found it, but they're asking for your business address to register your motorcycle. And I don't know what made me look in there, but I found it. I spent a lot of time going through this book. Some words of interest, one of them will be uh, a motor vehicle. Because they always claim you're driving a motor vehicle. And it's possible you are if you're in commerce. Now, one thing I have to say about a motor vehicle is it's a vehicle first. A motor vehicle has a very narrow definition. I mean, it's very narrow, and you have to be in commerce, where a vehicle can be anything. A vehicle can be a wheelchair, a skateboard, roller skates, a bicycle. These are all vehicles. So your car is a vehicle until you use it in commerce. Then it changes to a motor vehicle. It's almost like a kitchen knife. It's just a kitchen knife until somebody gets stabbed and killed with it, then it turns into a murder weapon. The vehicle is the same thing. It's a vehicle until you use it as a motor vehicle. Yes, sir? If, if going to and from work, is that considered commerce? That's traveling. Are you, doing, are you accepting money? Are you carpooling? If you're carpooling, you're in commerce. Oh, OK. All right. So we so you, there has to be an exchange of money or goods, some kind of trade to put you in the commerce. But you're going back and forth to work. No. You can, you can carry your own goods with you wherever you want. As long as it's for your own personal use, you have the right of the highways. And the highways are not just the highways, they're the rights of way. For everybody. <coughs> Question? I just, A little absurdity I wanted to throw in here. While I was doing my graduate work, we studied bicycles extensively for uh, walkable communities. And we found out that, that in New York State, they don't want you to know who this, the bicycle contingent, the people who want bicycle pads. But in New York State, the minute you enter into the street with a bicycle, any size diameter tire, you're under the vehicle traffic law, they claim. So when you come off the sidewalk, if you go into the street, you cross the street. Or the people that drive, that choose to drive their bicycles in the street, they must obey vehicle and traffic law. Um, under New York State law, it's up to the in individual cities or villages to determine whether or not they can ban bicycles from sidewalks. Um, 
those that choose to, uh, they don't determine whether the ban applies to the appropriate sized bicycle. Now, I say that to say this. Originally, the way the intent of this legislation was to allow the ind individual villages to determine whether or not bicycles had to not be on sidewalks in business districts, they could determine that by the size of the bike. It took a lot of research to find this out, but a 20-inch bicycle is usually ridden by a child. You don't want a child in the carriageway. You want a child on the sidewalk. So a village would say, 26-inch tires can't be in this business district. In the village of Williamsville on Main Street on the sidewalk, we want them in the street. But 20-inch tires, they're not banned from the sidewalk. Uh, maybe this is too far aside, but I thought it was important for people to know that even bicycles, once they enter the carriageway and they're crossing the street or they're in the street, under New York State law, are required to comply with vehicle and traffic laws. Where do you find that law? Basically, it sounds like an ordinance to me, a town ordinance. It's, um, it's a state law that the cities are in control of the ordinances. They delegate whether or not the city, whether or not the city or the village can ban bicycle traffic from the sidewalk to the smaller government entity. It's a state law that delegates it to them. Not many do it at all. But it is an ordinance. Yeah, it'd be a local ordinance. It's also a color of law, which yeah. Um, that would make it administrative, and uh, I've just luckily finished up with administrative court. I'm studying to be a paralegal, and uh, you don't believe the stuff that they spoon feed you when you're learning. It's the same thing they're giving to the lawyers. It's 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 what they want you to know, but it's not what's true. So they believe it, and they, and they teach it, and they think they're teaching you the right thing, but they're not. But, an administrative court, you can only be a plaintiff. You don't go to administrative court to be judged. You go to administrative court to complain or file a charge against somebody in the administration. There's no other reason to be there. And if you go to administrative court, you can take the people in the court to another administrative court. Because the one you usually go to won't even admit it's an administrative court. Your vehicle and traffic laws, uh, the Bureau, Department of Motor Vehicles, agency, they're all administrative, every one of them. State police, administrative. Buffalo police, administrative. They're all under administrative law. So when you go to court, you're under administrative law. Now, I just did a roundy round with uh, a judge out in Wheatfield, and uh, I tried to get her to tell me what the jurisdiction was, and of course, she wouldn't. She wouldn't tell me. And what I did is I said that uh, this is an administrative court. And she says, no, it's not. And she might have been right, because the judges switch hats while you're in court, and they don't tell you when they do it. They'll bring you in on a criminal charge for a violation, am I correct? And then they'll tell you it's civil, and then administrative. Your first appearance is administrative, and that's when you go talk to the prosecutor for a plea. That's your only administrative chance. So you should have paperwork filed when you go in for that ticket. There should be something in there. And if you want to know what you're truly in, ask what the burden of proof is. If it's beyond a reasonable doubt, it's criminal. Okay? So, when you go to administrative, that's not it. All they're going to operate on is preponderance of evidence, and that's 51% proof. And they're going to open up your folder and look inside that folder, and they're going to see a traffic ticket or a summons. That's the only thing in there, and that's a preponderance of evidence. It's prima facie, and they presume, like I told you before, 
They presume everything that is not favorable to you. That's their MO. So I talked to the judge a little more. She was very nice. She could answer a lot of my questions. And I asked what kind of court it was. And she told me that, uh, as a matter of fact, the judge should not really be talking to you. It is the prosecutor. The prosecutor should be answering all your questions. It's the prosecutor that should be giving you the jurisdiction, proving the jurisdiction. And the police officer should file a valid cause of action. And they don't do that. You don't know the nature and cause of the charges. And all they will tell you about is the cause. You don't know what wearing a, not wearing a seatbelt means. Or you don't know what going 55 and a 45 means. <clears throat> like you're stupid. But you're not. You just don't know any better. So when they ask you if you understand the charges, 99% of the people or more are going to say yes when they don't understand the nature of the charges. Where are they getting the jurisdiction from? And they're getting it from Title 49. And that's transportation code. And if they want to yank your license, the courts really can't do that either. That's supposed to be done through the Department of Transportation. And they juggle their jurisdiction around between the Department of Motor Vehicles and the Department of Transportation. And you don't know where they're coming. They really do make an effort to make it as difficult as possible for you to get any kind of relief. And if you can't get relief, you're not getting a fair trial, if it's even a trial. I think most things are foregone. And the officers pretty much will tell you that they're in law enforcement. And law enforcement's not what you want. You're looking for a peace officer because the peace officer is what was the original intent for the police force. And law enforcement is just another word for revenue enhancement. Now, you can get a lot of information by going to Rodney Class's site. He has, oh, about three years of archives, and I have every single one of them. And you can watch him start from the beginning like I did when I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to interpret the law. I didn't know any, any of the legalese. And he teaches you how to look up words, what they mean, where to find bills, and anything you need in Congress. Uh, the legislative intent is very important. To find legislative intent will tell you what they meant instead of depending on the court's interpretation. Because the court's interpretation is usually pretty lopsided. So I don't even know if I got to your answer yet. I got off on the administrative kick, I apologize. So was the judge was the judge correct then in saying that he's not obligated to follow UCC and, and the recourse provisions within it? You would have to read New York State's administrative law, and you'll find that under NYCRR. I want to say it's Title 15, and where exactly it is, I don't know. But I know that you can uh, represent, not represent, you can counsel anybody. Uh, but they have to follow the administrative code from 1946, which is what the federal government put in place. So if you want to get to the genesis of the code, go to the UCC or go to the CFR and look under administrative law. It should be under Title 18 or 28. And that will give you where you need to go to start. The rule